is local television. It's who do we really work for. I was a photographer. That's what I started with, the film camera. So I had to worry about light and sound, and that was fun. Life-changing disasters, politics, and championship seasons. All of these stories have shaped our communities, our lives. Tonight, we talk with some of the people that have recorded these unforgettable images that are etched in our memories. We take a look back on 60 years of local television. Hello, I'm David DeCosmo. Welcome to 60 Years of Local Television. On June 7, 1953, Scranton's first television station, WGBI, signed on the air for the first time. At the reins of the McGargie family, there's no other story like this one. A family of five women managing and operating a television station in the very early days of broadcasting. Over the years, WGBI became WDAU and then WYOU. For 30 years, Madge McGargie Holcomb saw to the day-to-day -day business of the station. Her son, Doug, tells us what life was like for this pioneering family. college as a sophomore to come run this business basically is what happened my grandmother was didn't have a head for business to be honest with you and she needed someone and my mother being the oldest of, of five children at the time was the likely candidate it, it wasn't your typical family uh, your, your, or your typical mom or dad working. I get to see the business from both sides. My mother, obviously, from the operational side, the management side of the business, but my father also was the promotions coordinator or director. A lot of my friends growing up as a youngster had working moms, uh, but they tended to be in education or healthcare as nurses or whatever. But to have a mother who actually was responsible for this type of business and had literally uh, hundreds of people uh, you know, res that she was responsible to, and most of them male, uh, it, it was unique, certainly unique. When she went to the national events, like the National Association of Broadcasters would have annual conventions, and at those times it did sink in that she was unique and that she was going to these conventions or these broad national association meetings, and she may be the only woman or literally only one of few women in the room with hundreds and hundreds of men from around the country that were in the same industry or business. Especially after her recent death in the last few years uh, of hearing from people about how uh, a pioneer she was in the industry. So I, I don't really think we had a sense of it locally here, but nationally she had a great reputation. There was an article like, from Newsweek magazine in 1957 that speaks of a 27-year-old woman, uh, a mother of three, running this type of business. And that's just amazing to think of her, 27 years old. Today that would be amazing, but to do that in the 50s is just, it's just unbelievable. They were all basically on the board of directors and obviously co-owners. They, in their day-to-day -day lives, took a more typical uh, uh, role in their families and so did their husbands. Uh, so their involvement wasn't their day-to-day, -day, but uh, obviously they were crucial in decision-making processes. Like somebody would call the house phone and say, tell your mom there's a fire, fire on Cedar Avenue. You know, and boom, you'd, you'd relay the message to match because we had two phone lines coming into our home. One was strictly for business. We stayed off that line. That was for the television business and then uh, a regular line for our house uh, activities. But many times we would get phone calls uh, learning ourselves to news events where my mother would grab one or two of us and say, come on, we're going to go see a fire. My mother, if there was one sector of the business she really prided herself on, it was the news. It really was the news and the production of the news and having what she felt was the most quality product she could put out there. On January 1st, 1953, the Baltimore family won the race for television in the area. At 11.53 a.m., their station, WBRE, became the first to hit the airwaves in Wyoming Valley. I would say um, right after World War II, they decided we'd better start thinking about television. We took the uh, two radio studios, converted them into uh, 
television studios, which necessitated putting in a lot of video cables, a lot of lighting, and some sets for news. That was the beginning of local television. We were the first on the air from up at the transmitter. We kept watching what was then WILK TV, making sure we were ahead of them all the time, which we did. We were the first. That was my 10th wedding anniversary, and we opened the station on that day. We were the first UHF station on the air. The whole family was there. It was very exciting. We were the first million watt station on the air. We were the first color locally. They were on top of everything. We learned the uh, technical end of transmission and microwaves ourselves. We learned the, sometimes the hard way. But we learned. The first day was uh, everything in a hurry, signing on with the national anthem. Our program director, Franklin Coslett, who later became the newsman, introduced the public and the Baltimore family. It was, it was just the beginning of a long, wonderful time. And I went down the railroad tracks. They said that they're rescuing some people from a air shaft. So I went down there and I got, I would manage to get these guys being pulled up from the air shaft. There was a bunch of them come up. Uh, women waiting for their husbands to come out of that mine, crying. That was WDAU news photographer Jack Scanella remembering the Knox mine disaster. In 60 years, technology has changed an awful lot in television. Back in the 50s, a camera like this one probably would have been used to bring you the news. Today, a smartphone might be thrown into the mix. We sat down with two veteran news photographers to talk about the good old days. Camera, because he wants to be like Dad. And uh, the year here is 1987, and now he's a, uh, a doctor in Philadelphia. So wow. I guess time is flying. Uh, I worked for a photo studio. I worked there for three years. I saw in a, in a magazine uh, the, the cover page was wanted 2,000 photographers. And it had to do with the fact that the FCC had just released and had granted this area five stations. So uh, I thought, that's what I want to do. I, I photographed on the road for 25 years. All new stories. The film was in a reel with a, a plastic core that fit in here in a reel. I had to be very careful. That cork would pop out and you'd spill all your film. Put that in there and you would move the film down through here and come out here. And then you would push it up in here and put it in here, wrapped around, and close it. You did this all in the dark, in the dark. You had to feel this. We didn't have sound until 1955. Um, and uh, I remember the first story we did, that first big story, was the, um, the hurricane of 55, I think it was. We went up into uh, the Pocono Mountain area where a camp of boys was uh, inundated. They were on an island in the middle of the, uh, the creek, and uh, there was 25 boys drowned. And when we got up there, uh, first thing we saw in this open area was the 25 bodies covered with sheets all in a row. It wasn't nice to see. These cameras, first of all, were indestructible. There's, there's many stories about photographers losing their cameras, falling out of things, falling places, but they always work. Kind of amazing when you think about it, what it took to uh, gather a new story with a, a camera such as this, a Fresolini camera. And just recently, I was at a fire in Luzerne County up in a very high wooded area where there was no way to get a live truck to the scene. I was with reporter Mark Killer, and it was the first time with a smartphone, with an iPhone, we actually shot a one-minute package. Mark was the reporter. 
uh, at the fire scene and just with the software on the iPhone was able to send it back to Wilkesbury and get it on the air in, you know, I don't know, 15 minutes. I miss the camaraderie. That's what I miss. We had, you know, it was a good time. I enjoyed every minute. I never put in a boring day. And I worked for 42 years in that business. Never a boring day, and I can say that truthfully. With a tenure of over 17 years, Keith Martin is a local television icon. The general sat down with us a few weeks ago to talk about what he remembers most about his days here at Eyewitness News. Good morning and welcome to a special edition of Eyewitness News Veterans Views. The depth and strength of character of the people of northeastern Pennsylvania is probably the biggest story that I covered uh, in my 32 years in front of the camera. The, the, list, the list is long. Uh, the Dan Flood trial, the Three Mile Island accident, the blizzard and flood of 96, the Lake Cary tornado more recently, the, the greatest strength of, of northeastern Pennsylvania, and I was able to observe it, report it repeatedly over many years is the people. Coming from a, uh, a strongly military background, I, I always believe, believe that you need to lead by example. A good piece of leadership is motivation. On a day-to-day -day basis, uh, when you're sitting thinking about, well, I've got to cover a school board meeting or a, uh, a fender bender down on South Main Street, it can become routine. The underlying philosophy and beauty of local television, and that's really what we're talking, this is local television. It's who do we really work for? And I found that it was both fun, uh, motivational, uh, to constantly remind the troops in the field, the, the producers, the uh, all the people who work so hard, because the person or persons you see in front of the camera are only the tip of the iceberg. But keeping everybody functioning as a team, I always thought was, was critically important. Who do we work for? And what makes me proudest about this 60th anniversary. Uh, we're on cable all over places we could never have reached before, but what has never changed is the commitment from the top down, from the highest manager to the first person who comes in and does the early morning news is the commitment to the people of the area. ...of Operation Desert Storm. In Saudi Arabia, I'm Keith Martin, Eyewitness News. Happy anniversary, WBRE and WYOU. Congratulations on 60 years in broadcasting. Born and raised in Scranton, I have fond memories of watching my father on WDAU. Here's to 60 more years. I started as an anchor man in late summer of 1971. My family and I came here from Ohio. I eventually became a weatherman, eventually did some outdoor reporting, a thing called Bird's Eye View. The first couple of big stories that I covered here were the fall snowstorm in 1971, Thanksgiving storm we called it, which almost everybody's forgotten because six months later we know what happened. Hurricane Agnes came roaring through, and that's something that no one will ever forget, I'm sure. That was WDAU anchorman Derry Bird. From presidential visits to terrible mine tragedies, these two stations have shared many historical events with you over the years. Perhaps the most remembered, the 1972 Agnes Flood. News photographer Charlie Hayes and Jim Keenan remember back to those first few days covering that disaster. Agnes, I have no problem remembering Agnes. Uh, during that tremendous flood, I spent four days in a helicopters. When I got here, there was only one person in the building. It's John Sohan. He was an engineer. And he was preparing to take camera equipment out. And I lend a hand. I was directing at the time. And I said, John, what are we going to do? And he said, well, let's go up the Penobscot Mountain. First day, an old antique helicopter. Second day, we went up in an Air Force chopper. Uh, they took some uh, supplies to some of the towns, water, medical supplies. The third day, in a Navy chopper. And then the fourth day, we went up with all the politicians. And a second time with a Jeep and got the, the film out and a projector and some other odds and ends, some mics. We tried to come down the third time, and the water had risen so high that we got stopped 
at the top of Northampton Street. It was really tough to do because I have, up until that point, I have never seen as much devastation and destruction. I mean, there were homes torn apart and gone. National Guard brought us down to the studio, and we went up towards the parking lot and realized we could no longer get into the building. So we came back out, and we were headed uh, south towards the Wyoming, uh, uh, the YMCA. Made a left there, and uh, there were people hanging out the windows, yelling to us and all. And, and also at Boscos parking lot, uh, there were people standing. When we hit Northampton and South Main Street, the windows were breaking in all the stores, and there was uh, mannequins floating by, and there was there was a diamond store, uh, a jewelry store right on the corner of Northampton and and uh, South Main, and there were diamonds, trays of diamonds, and rings and, and watches going down. The one part that I remember too is we we piled into the back of an army deuce and a half. That's what we called them, a big army truck, and uh, we drove down some of these streets. And uh, it was it was heartbreaking. I mean, people were crying and moving things out onto their porch, and you could see water lines well up to the second floor on the homes that were left. And if you go into the studio, you'll see, and I believe it's still there, you can see where the insulation changes. And that was the height of the water and that insulation. And also over on the left-hand side of the corner, there's a turntable. And that was filled with water, and we had to bail that out. As far as shooting it, it was, it was tough. Everything was dirty and dusty. Everything smelled. I'll never forget the smell of the flood. It's something that you just can't get out of your head. And uh, everything was brown and muddy and dirty. Uh, there were no colors. You didn't see colors because they were just smeared into the whole landscape of the flood itself. We, we couldn't broadcast. We we're still broadcasting from, from the mountain and it was limited staff that needed up there. So we all came down and cleaned, right? And we cleaned and cleaned and cleaned and cleaned. And finally, uh, uh, one day they announced that we had, nobody had power. They had to run new lines to, to get power to the building. There was so many follow-ups. Uh, we had to do medical report stories on the flood. We did uh, help stories where people were trying to get help and clothing and supply for the people, uh, follow up. The president came in, uh, Nixon was here, we were taping or filming him, and uh, it's just one story after another for probably a couple, two or three years. No one was ever laid off. And it was a family type thing. It, it was the best thing that uh, it, it was a tragedy thing, but it's the best thing, in my opinion, that could have happened because it bonded us as broadcasters. Uh, I believe we're a breed of people. Congratulations to WBRE and WYOU on 60 fantastic years of broadcasting. And now it's on like Donkey Kong. There's no doubt about it, Eyewitness News sports director Jim Miller and sports reporter Sid Michaels were very close friends. Both worked for 20 years at WBRE. All these years later, they're still very close friends. Sid takes us back to the days here in the newsroom to talk about some of the big events they've covered. When I was young, growing up here in northeastern Pennsylvania, WBRE was the station to watch. The Baltimores had uh, WBRE right at the top, and as long, as, or as far back as I could remember, Jerry Baum was the man with the sports. Uh, I opened up the TV guide, and there's an ad, and uh, Jim Miller is coming to WBRE Sports. This is Jim Miller saying welcome to our electrifying 30-minute pregame special. I wondered who the guy with the long face was because Jim had that, that profile. And so anyway, came down in September uh, full-time, and the rest is history. And uh, uh, we were together for 18 years. Hey, I'm Jim Miller along with Sid Michaels. We're halfway and, through as we And in 18 years, Jim and I never had an argument, got along famously. We always used to kid around because we come in uh, between 2 and 2.30 every day, and we, we were the only department in the world that started our day with a coffee break. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. We're live from Pocono International Raceway in Long Pond, Pennsylvania. This is known as the, the auto racing uh, station because we covered uh, NASCAR 
and I got an opportunity to go to the Daytona 500, to the first Brickyard, uh, to Charlotte for the 600, um, and a number of different tracks. And of course, our live shows we did from the garage area up at Pocono, and um, then drag racing because of Joe Amato. And until, uh, until WBRE covered Joe, here was a world champion in drag racing, one of the greatest of all time in the sport and got very little coverage. There were also memorable high school moments. The Carbondale area team, I believe it was in the early 90s, the underhanded scoop shot by Leo Scarupa to beat George Jr., who was like playing the Miami Heat. And, uh, and Carbondale area was able to beat them. And, and then of course the runs, uh, the run by the Berwick uh, football team was at six state championships. Keith, it is just madness here in, in the locker room where the Red Barons have won the International League Eastern Division title. It's been a long four years. It was inevitable this was going to happen. I'll take over for Sid. So many people I'll never waiting. forget how he got on me about that. He said, my eyes started burning, and he said I could barely talk because the beer was going to my nose and to my eyes and to my ears and to my mouth. And he said, then I look, and it was you that did it, he said. So to this day, we still have a pretty good laugh about, uh, about that. Last year was rough for Jim because he developed throat cancer and went through some pretty extensive surgery several months back and uh, removed his voice box and a good part of his, um, uh, his throat area, uh, part of his thyroid, went through chemotherapy, went through radiation, and now can't talk. Uh, the plan is for him to eventually have surgery to have an implant, a device implanted in his throat so he can learn to talk again. But the one thing that he was famous for was the thing that was taken away. Uh, it's amazing uh, how, how ironic life is. But he seemed to be doing well. We stay in touch, and he always tells me to tell everybody back here, you know, hello for him, and, and he misses everybody. And he's going to try to get back sometime this summer to, to see a lot of people back in, in this area. The Steelers and the Chargers, a championship Sunday, and we'll be right back. <laughs> I've been proud to be part of this news family for most of my broadcasting career. And it is a family. People who worked and are working behind the scenes to bring the news, weather, sports, and entertainment into your home every day. The faces and the technology may have changed over the years, but our commitment to this community is just as strong now as it was when we first went on the air 60 years ago. I'm David DeCosmo. Thanks for watching. And here's hoping all of your news is good.